Welcome, everyone, to the American Maritime Podcast. I'm Mike Roberts, your host. I want to thank the American Maritime Partnership for sponsoring this podcast. I'm extremely pleased uh, to be speaking today with Dr. Michael Pillsbury. And let me take a minute to uh, put this discussion into context for our listeners. Dr. Pillsbury is an expert on China, and that word expert needs a proper adjective like preeminent or leading or elite. <laughs> Uh, according to the book Chaos Under Heaven, Dr. Pillsbury, along with Dr. Peter Navarro, who we know in this industry, Steve Bannon, and a few others, a very few others, were the original architects of President Trump's policy on China, which was a radical departure from prior administrations, both Republican and Democratic. Dr. Pillsbury directs the Center on Chinese Strategy at the Hudson Institute and has been called, quote, the driving force behind the recent evolution of American foreign policy toward China by leaders of both parties in Congress. I became familiar with Dr. Pillsbury through his book, The 100-Year Marathon, uh, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. The book was published in 2015. I recommend it to you strongly. If you haven't read it yet, uh, it is it rose to number one on the Washington Post bestsellers list and was truly groundbreaking in exposing China's ambitions and providing uh, real context to what we've been seeing of China in the last several decades. Uh, this is a maritime podcast, and the subject of China is extremely relevant to the American maritime industry. And I say that because the realization that China is in some real sense at war with America and could very well prevail if we don't <clears throat> respond effectively, that realization directly contradicts the basic policy framework that has guided our national security and economic decisions for decades, including the laws and regulations governing the U.S. commercial maritime sector. It is so important to understand what's going on with China in its competition with the U.S., and particularly for this op audience, China's maritime ambitions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of anyone who has done more than Dr. Pillsbury uh, with impeccable credentials and credibility to help America come to that realization. So I promise this will be my last introductory comment. Uh, I just want to thank you for your service and for your courage in revealing uh, what we're really facing in China. So with that, uh, welcome, Dr. Pillsbury. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. So I, I just will start out by if, asking if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit about your background. Well, I was born in California, and I went to the local school, Stanford, with a BA in history. We got my first interest in China from the faculty there. They guided me to go off to get a PhD in uh, political science with a focus on China uh, at Columbia. Then I was hired by the RAND Corporation uh, and did a variety of uh, government jobs over the years. So I'm uh, what President Trump uh, often refers to as the deep state. <laughs> <laughs> and that includes time on, the, on Capitol Hill? and Yes, I was a Senate staffer for several committees, several different senators. Um, in many ways, our, our Constitution sets up a strange foreign policy decision-making process where the Senate gets to confirm or block the confirmation of senior officials, including ambassadors. Treaties must be ratified by the Senate. So the Constitution and the Founding Fathers thought they were building a, a kind of a two-part system. Uh, in some cases, court decisions would get a role of two. But they did not give the king of America in quotation marks, right. sole power. Uh, so in many ways, if you have a job both on Capitol Hill as a member or staff member and work in the executive branch, you begin to realize the founding fathers may have had a very wise approach uh, to have the executive branch have to justify what it does. Uh, to some suspicious and wary members of the House and Senate. Mm -hmm. And I got to see that for years and years and years. So no matter which side I'm advising, and I was just down in Orlando, Florida, talking to most of the uh, Republican congressmen who had their annual sort of retreat to discuss issues. I was talking with them about China. And I realized the gap between what the executive branch and White House 
think they're doing on China and then what the Congress, which is much more impatient now on mm-hmm. China, thinks should be done. Interesting. And you spent time not only on the Hill, but also in the administration mm-hmm. uh, and, and in China. You spent a lot of time in China, as I understand it. Yes, I was forced. <clears throat> not all China specialists can speak Chinese at all. Uh, many of them can just say, hello, you know, nice necktie you're wearing. I was forced to go into a two-year program wow. uh, in Taiwan where I could not speak English for the two years. And a terrible thing starts to happen that you start having dreams in Chinese and people are talking in the dream in Mandarin. Then you know you've, you know, you've gotten it. But that's a really a big weak point of our China specialist field. Mm-hmm. Uh, or people who write books and articles about China today often don't know the language, the culture, or the history. And they believe strongly that it's not important. We're dealing with a brand new China. It kind of was invented five or ten years ago, and there's no need to waste time even learning how to pronounce the name of the leader of China. You'd be surprised. President Trump got it. President Biden has it. His last name is Xi, President Xi, like S-H-E-E. But a large number of commentators people with PhDs, generals and admirals who come on TV, they call him G, like G whiz. And there are several other possibilities because XI, how do you know how to pronounce mm-hmm. that? So even a little thing like that, when you call him President G, that's another person. It's like calling a guy whose name is Mike Roberts, Mike Smith. It'd be mm-hmm. a major error. So my fear about the China specialization of our country is we're very thin on people, especially young people, who really have been forced, as I was, to spend years learning the language, the history, the culture, then analyze uh, Xi Jinping's most recent speech about the maritime strategy. Well, that comes through very clearly, your, your, your language skills and your, uh, and your study on, on Chinese history comes through very clear in your book, 100-Year Marathon. And, and uh, as I say, it was, it was a, a truly an eye-opening uh, read for me uh, and, and the way you put it into context. And, and so that, that insight, both historical and contemporary, uh, is, is, is unique and, and, and so ver- very valuable. We could spend hours on this, but let me just ask you to take this wherever direction you like to, and I know you will. Uh, uh, could you talk about the ultimate goals of the uh, Chinese government, of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, I argue in 100 Year Marathon that their strategy is secret. It's not in their speeches. It's not when they have a delegation come to visit your company or your Capitol Hill office. They have a secret strategy. They don't want us to know about it. I know a little bit about it from documents, from defectors from China, uh, from declassified materials that the CIA and FBI let me quote in the book. So I put forward a, a point of view, a thesis, about what their strategy might be and a number of key concepts. I introduce one in each chapter, the assassin's mace concept the comprehensive national power metric. They measure them how, how they're doing and their ultimate goal. Their use of influence operations inside the United States to guide us toward what they consider the proper view of their strategy, which by the way, is that they have no strategy. One of, their, one of my favorite Chinese scholars, professor at uh, Beijing University, was asked to write an article for Foreign Affairs, arguably our most prestigious foreign policy journal, about 10 years ago. Does China have a grand strategy? And his answer was no. And the article argues that they're just kind of not that bright. (laughs) They're feeling their way forward. There's a proverb about touching stones as you cross the river. And they're really kind of lost. And they face many, many, many obstacles. The older population getting larger. Uh, water table issues, lack of uh, food, they have to import oil and gas. So this line, this Chinese communist line, is adopted by, uh, I think, the majority of our China experts in America. That's part of the secret strategy. Identify influential people, bring them to China, explain just how benign China is, just how poor China is. We have an expression, don't worry your pretty little face about it. The Chinese have a similar expression. Mm -hmm. And I have a section in the book called the message police, how they have a feedback loop where they see where are people popping up who are off message, who are saying things that hurt China's long-term strategy. 
and then they focus on countering that message. So this book itself was treated in a very strange way by the Chinese. On the one hand, they had a ceremony, they had to be the translation, published by the Chinese military. The National Defense University Press of China published a perfect translation of this book. That's shocking. With a preface written by two generals. <laughs> then I said, great, you know, the royalties, if it just sells 100 million copies and I get $1 per copy. That's pretty good. This will fund the Hudson Institute China research for a long time. They said, Dr. Pillsbury, no, I'm very sorry. Didn't you notice your book is secret? Oh. Only party members and military officers can buy it. There'll be no royalty for you. I said, why is it secret? It's public materials. I quote a lot of your own documents in here. And the Chinese general said, yes, that's right. There are things in this book that the Chinese people are not ready to understand hmm. and to hear about. And one of the, I guess, for examples, there's one long chapter on just how close U.S.-China strategic cooperation was. Many people have no idea. The United States, through the CIA, spent $2 billion, with a B, buying weapons from China, from the Chinese military, mm -hmm. to provide them to various covert action projects around the world, and specifically including Afghanistan. That's just the beginning of our cooperation with China, which in many ways was greater, was more intimate than with NATO or with Japan. We were really close allies in the Cold War, and we succeeded, I think, in bringing down the old Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So this part of the story the Chinese side consider secret because they don't want, as they stir up kind of anti-American hostility now in China, they don't want to explain, well, gee, why did you all do all this? Under, uh, beginning with Nixon and Kissinger, then Jimmy Carter expanded it, Ronald Reagan expanded it the most. Mm -hmm. But Reagan put conditions on it. Mm -hmm. So this is some of the chapters of the book, uh, telling the story from the Chinese side, but also revealing from the American side what exactly has been going on right. the last 40 or 50 years right. in U.S.-China relations that almost nobody knows about, including, I'm sorry to say, my fellow brother and sister China specialists who were very angry at this book. They said, you, how could you say all this? We didn't know this. I said, well, why don't you recommend my book? No, it makes us look bad <laughs> if we recommend your book. Uh-huh. Huh. Well, it, 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 uh, it, it, where we are today, I think, re reflects more your line of thinking than in what's reflected in that book than, than where we were five years ago, for sure. Uh, it so, takes 21 hours to listen to the book on the Audible or the CD okay. version. There you go. So it's not an easy thing. But a, a number of people have read it, and you can often see the plagiarism involved. You'll hear a senior official say something, and you realize, oh, my God, that was in Chapter 7. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mind. I wanted to influence our debate right. on China's strategy. Right. I wanted to take a stand that they're not Fu Manchu, they're not devils, they're not Hitler, they're not Stalin, they're not trying to take over the world with uh, Army, Navy, Air Force troops everywhere. That is totally wrong. Uh -huh. But they're not the poor little developing country with no strategy that they say they are either. There's something going on in which they've embedded themselves in our own political system, our own media, and they've got senior Americans taking the Chinese line without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas we cannot do that inside China. Uh, right. Our ability to influence China is extremely limited, close to zero, Right. other than uh, sanctions, uh, tariffs, a number of things President Trump pioneered and it appears to me that President Biden is continuing. Mm -hmm. That is a seeking of leverage on the Chinese leadership to get them to take a different course than what they've been taking. But so far, we're not succeeding. Mm -hmm. a, a, a large part of the uh, Chinese strategy f from your book uh, is, is mercantilist in, in nature. Mm -hmm. It's commercial. It's, yes. not, it's not necessarily building up the military, although that certainly happened and accelerated in, in recent years. Can you talk a little bit about the mercantilist strategy and how, that, how, how China, China intends to leverage their, their advantages there? Well, their term for mercantilist is two words. One word means emphasize, zhong. The other word means shang, means business, to emphasize business. So 
the concept of mercantilism in our history comes out of the 1600s, basically, that in international balance of power maneuvers, you want to build up your own foreign reserves. You want to get the most gold of the other players. You want to prevent the other, and China does all of these things under their mercantilist. They've learned from our uh, 1600s experience. Mm -hmm. um, you want to prevent a coalition against you. The French did this a lot. The French didn't want Germany to unify. So there was something called the Cardinal Richelieu's strategy to subsidize different parts of the German, what became Germany later, to make sure they all fought each other. For This is over 100 years. To try to get the most gold, to try to use only your ships. Mercantile strategy includes a maritime component. If you look back at the French, British, uh, and others, the, the Spanish, the Portuguese, you'll see what the Chinese said. They had a very important moment in 2007 where they put about a 10-hour series that all Chinese, hundreds of millions, watched this. It was called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Hmm. And they went around the world and interviewed historians and others. How did Spain become the leading power in the world at the time? How did the Dutch and British replace the Spanish and Portuguese? Exactly how? What steps? What happened? Mm -hmm. Then what about the rise of Britain? What about the rise of America? And they deduced a number of lessons that they're making public. Now, you would think in 2007, American China experts would go, my God, we need to pay attention to this. No, we never translated it. People thought it was some kind of a historical, quaint, uh, strange TV program. But actually, it was a refinement of what they've been trying the previous 20 or 30 years, look, seeking lessons. And one of the lessons was each of these powers that rose had a mercantilist approach, stole technology, subsidized their big uh, naval operations or maritime industries, um, did a number of things that involve keeping track of how we're doing, metrics. The Spanish king could count the gold coming from Peru. Mm -hmm. He knew how many ships were coming in. So it was a conscious approach to if you want global market domination, what do you have to do exactly? And I tried to argue in 100 Year Marathon in one of my chapters on how they designed their mercantilist system. They focused a lot of effort on learning from other countries. <laughs> Including the United States. In the United States is the number one example. Yeah. And I have a chapter where I describe what they told me, how the Americans are pioneers in intellectual property theft <laughs> and mercantilism. I did not know Alexander Hamilton was such a big guy, such a, so big on tariffs. Uh -huh. And that I didn't know the patents were written into our Constitution. Yeah. So Interesting. Any, when they want to defend themselves, when they engage in some outrageous conduct and we catch them, they say, look, this is just what you Americans used to do in the 1870s and 1880s. <laughs> Even the Pillsbury <laughs> Company. It's one, I put in the book the story, one defector told me, uh, even the Pillsbury Company became dominant in flour uh, manufacturing in the 1890s because the Pillsbury Company sent spies to learn how the best European flour was made. And it was stainless steel rollers hmm. was the key, which the Americans didn't know. So they got some, they copied it, they used false names, brought it back. Pillsbury flour becomes the best flour in America even globally, hmm. through stolen technology using false names and spies. And the Chinese at that point just pause and say, how dare you criticize <laughs> us? Right. There's a pot calling the kettle black sort of <laughs> aspect of that. Um, the, um, uh, a little bit more on the, on the maritime aspects of the merc sure. mercantilist strategy. That the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is certainly mm -hmm. people are familiar with where you know, they buy uh, terminals, marine terminals at both ends of the pa Panama Canal and, and many other investments around right. the world strategically uh, designed. There's also the, uh, the, the uh, relatively recently developed information concerning support, subsidies uh, provided by the Chinese government to right. Chinese shipping and shipbuilding. Um, uh, any comment on, 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 on that, 
maritime side of things? Uh, it looks like the maritime strategy of China f fits, or in many ways is a template for other sectors. I myself first woke up to the maritime strategy in China in 2012. I was invited to a conference, huge conference, a whole bunch of Chinese, a few foreigners, um, put on by the what they call the Maritime Bureau. Haiyang, Haiyang is maritime. She is a bureau. And I'd never heard of this thing. It's a huge building on the main street in downtown Beijing. So I go to it. It's the military guys who want me to come. If you want to understand China, you know, come with us to this conference. Um, a lot of military was there. Turned out they had some of the original planners from the 1970s of China's opening up policy. And a lot of panels went on for two days. They had a magazine. They had books. They had a publishing house. It's a cabinet minister in charge of it. Um, they were talking about subsidies, fish, maritime resources, the ratio of government investment in order to dominate the world, what the British had done. All of this is unfolding on these panels at the meeting. And I'm thinking to myself, I never heard of this maritime. I went back to our embassy. I said, I don't understand. You know, I'm not the smartest China expert in the world. Uh, what is this all about? And the embassy basically said, we don't know either. Hmm. There's this gigantic ministry called the Maritime Administration. Later on, it's, and I tell some of the story in 100 Year Marathon, this administration decided we need a Coast Guard. We need to put the five different units together to do maritime activities for the government and unify them. And part of the Chinese strategy overall, by the way, is to get other countries to help you, even though they should not. So they reached out to the United States, to our Coast Guard. We put a Coast Guard officer in our embassy in Beijing, and he advised them. It's all quite legal. So if you want to have a world-class Coast Guard, notice that phrase, world-class Coast Guard, and maritime energy, maritime industry, here's the template for how we did it. We gave them manuals. We invited them to Coast Guard conferences. <laughs> we helped them. It was an American initiative to build a strong right. Chinese Coast Guard. Yeah. We showed them how if you own a port, you can get certain benefits out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in many ways, their maritime administration that I'm describing this conference in 2012, it was the beneficiary already of some of this, and then even more sense them. This is really the heart of Chinese strategy. Render the other side complacent about what you're doing, but get them to help you. Mm -hmm. Buy your exports, provide technology, provide advice. It's really quite clever. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the, the studies that, that we've produced, that have been produced in recent, in, in the last year or so, concerning the, the volume, the CSIS study right. in particular, mm -hmm. uh, suggests $130 billion in support over a 10-year period. And, and that's a conservative figure in, in your view? Yes, like I read the CSIS study. And I, what I liked is the description of what we don't know. Uh -huh. They say, yes, we have this number. It's $130 billion, you know, for subsidies of certain types that they got out of Chinese materials, basically. Then they say very carefully, and I'm sure very accurately, here's a long list of things we're not including because we can't get numbers. And the long list imp implied to me that it's like five or even ten times bigger, hmm. the subsidy, the advantages that the government's providing, and also the guidance. If the Chinese uh, intelligence services yeah. do what I think they're doing, they're a kind of subsidy also. They're telling the state-owned enterprises, Costco and so forth, here's an opportunity. You better go do it. At the same time, the bank can say, yeah, and here's, here's, a, here's a billion yeah. to do it. So this kind of system is not familiar to us. Not at all. And it's hard for us to see it. It turns out one of the things I discussed with President Trump one time, uh, and, and frankly, we had many, many meetings to talk about China. And he's a real leader on this. He thought about it for 20 years. It's in a couple of his early books. Mm -hmm. He's written, China's going to be the greatest challenge in American history. Hmm. So this is not something I implanted in him. I shared what I knew, but he already had the concept that they want to dominate us. So the maritime case study, for me, 
looks very similar to what's going on in other sectors. They now dominate the chemical industry, paints. They have no business being able to dominate the painting industry. Right. How'd they get the formulas? How'd they get the money? Auto parts, they're now the world's biggest market uh, factor in auto parts. That's not from peasant labor being cheaper. It's a conscious strategy that they pick out areas that they need to dominate, and then they basically take up to 20 years to do it. So they move so slowly while they're continuing to say, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Hmm. I think they have a winning strategy. I think President Trump came to believe that we just can't get leverage on them. Because it's like a two or three phase process. First, you have to know there's a problem. Something about America's primacy or our certain industry is being challenged. Second, come up with a solution. And then third, get it passed. Yeah. The Congress and the executive branch. And then fourth, all along, you'll have this, what I call the friends of China saying, don't do this, don't waste your time. It's not that important. China's a very poor backward country. And this, you haven't asked me yet, but this is part of the problem of this China task force report. This is a brilliant piece of work. It's a House task force, supposed to be bipartisan in the beginning. And it's got a total of 400 recommendations for what to do about China, including maritime. Mm -hmm. The problem is, who is going to do this? We don't have a department to take care of China. <laughs> we have pretty much the same people, the same units, very small around our government in the interagency process who work on China. It's In the Cold War, 1947, everything had to be changed. We had to create the National Security Council with a new law. Had to create the CIA. Didn't exist. Had to create the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> a lot of changes were made by Congress and the President Truman wanted it as well, to deal with the Soviet threat. Now we have many people, including me, saying the China threat is bigger than the Soviet threat, long-term and especially in economics and, and technology. But where is, the, where is the organizational change? Where's the big you know, team mm -hmm. that's going to work on China? And I think Joe Biden's people are beginning to figure this out now. Like, okay, it's the biggest challenge. What are we going to do? Who do we turn to? Mm -hmm. Where's the 500... Experts, they're not there. The, the one one <laughs> commentator uh, recently uh, uh, remarked that uh, we need a George Keenan-like mm -hmm. long telegram on China, and he's referring to the post-World uh, War II uh, roadmap that outlined uh, the U.S. policy of mm -hmm. containment uh, of the Soviet Union. We don't really, that's, that's not the George Keenan telegram yet. Uh, this this task force report, but but we're 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 working our way through it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think um, uh, you know, thinking about the commercial maritime industry uh, again, uh, we we have our cabotage laws in the mm -hmm. United States, the Jones Act, and that reserve U.S. domestic trade to American ships. Uh, more than eighty countries around the world have maritime cabotage laws, including China. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have thoughts about how China would view its its maritime cabotage law. I think the Chinese view, in terms of their strategy, would be much broader than just like the Chinese version of the Jones Act. If you tried to apply what the Chinese are doing uh, to America, you would have a cabinet department of maritime affairs, like they do. You would have massive subsidies to our shipbuilding, our shipping companies. You would have a huge R&D effort to get smarter, more effective, higher technology in the shipping business than you do at present. China's doing this and it's uh, made in China 2025. They specifically want higher technology in the maritime field to try to dominate the market share in the future. We don't do this. I actually went over to National Science Foundation one time. This is part of Chuck Schumer's new bill, by the way. Chuck Schumer went to all the Democratic chairmen uh, in the Senate and consolidated their ideas on what to do about China. Some of them are very good ideas. And one of them is to greatly increase the National Science Foundation's budget and to add technology to its mandate, not just pure science, so that companies can be assisted, our country can be assisted uh, with high tech, including maritime. National Science Foundation does zero on this. Zero. 
<laughs> so it's an interesting exercise. I like the Hudson Institute China Center um, that I direct. I'd like, it, I'd like to do this if we could get the funding. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a very simple question. If America had the Chinese strategy for maritime and shipping, maybe have the Navy included in terms of improving shipbuilding, shipyards, what would it look like? And then project current trends forward 10 or 15 years. Where are we going to be? The China maritime strategy, the new possible American maritime strategy, which one's going to be ahead at that time? This would be a very difficult project, but it's the kind of so-called net assessment that the offices I was in in the, in the government used to try to compare the two sides. Who's ahead, who's doing, who's got weaknesses, who's got strengths, I just, but I just don't see that in the for the maritime field yet. We don't have a strat. We don't have a policy response. Uh, I think that's that's clear. Uh, we we have only recently awoken to uh, the the threat. Uh, mm -hmm. Frankly, from the commercial side of things, and and uh, uh, and and we're we're just starting to realize how how large it is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not so much to the American maritime industry per se. Although it, you know, when when people talk about waiving the Jones Act and allowing mm -hmm. uh, foreign ships into our domestic markets, it's it, it's certainly a major concern to 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 the. Uh, the workers and the companies who are who are doing the work now, but but it really sort of the the ability of the Chinese to dominate global trade in times of peace through their maritime industry mm -hmm. is is just a, a, a subject that uh, uh, we haven't had a whole lot of conversation about. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of a task force on that issue uh, makes a lot of sense um, from my perspective. There's one very narrow question. Where, how much money is the U.S. government spending on R&D and technology to put our maritime industry, number one, in 15, 20 years? <laughs> how much? One possibility is zero. One possibility is, oh, Dr. Pillsbury, you know nothing. It's really $25 billion, but you just haven't added the numbers up. My hunch is it's much closer to zero. It's almost zero. And let's, t and let's look, take a look at the very same th figure in mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. And I bet they're thinking a lot about new technology for maritime shipbuilding, shipping, and their Navy. Right. And mariners. That and they've got the money to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to the U.S. importers. <laughs> Well, I, 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 uh, I think we're about out of time. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, we're just getting started. I know. I could talk all day, but I, I think we've got to we, – we, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Are we, are we getting close to, uh, close to the uh, witching hour here? But in any event, um, uh, I assume it's not the time now to be thinking about waiving or diluting the Jones Act or, or doing anything that would sh you know, shrink America – shipping and shipbuilding capacity? You know, I, this is partly I'm joking, but it wouldn't surprise me if the Chinese would not like to fund the idea to repeal the Jones Act. Interesting. And if this would fit the other sectors where they will hire a, a think tank, let's say, and then produce a paper on the Jones Act really violates the Founding Fathers' principles and violates Adam Smith. And it's really against American values. And we just can't have this kind of thing, you know. So a movement grows. And then the way our system works will be compromises. Oh, okay, we won't repeal the whole Jones Act, the part about American merchant uh, workforce. We'll keep that. But we'll change this a little bit. And we'll let Chinese companies come in and, you know, uh -huh. haul freight between ports. So a, dis um, a disinformation effort. Yes. Well, they call it an influence operation. Okay. To make sure that the point wow. of view exists that helps China. Now, this is illegal if you're paid to do it with a lobbying contract. Then you've got to register under the Foreign Agents right. Registration Act. So the FBI, in a Hudson report we put out a couple of years ago, some FBI friends told us, you need to, Congress needs to reword this act. Because if I get a billion dollars from China... I lobby senators in the White House for China. I'm a foreign agent. I need to register. But right now, you have to have a written contract. It has to have the word lobby. Only then must you register. And even then, a lot of people avoid it and try to register as lobbyists, 
mm-hmm. instead. So we don't have a good picture, according to the FBI. We don't have a good picture just how much lobbying is going on for China that is sort of unpaid in a contract, but the payment is in other ways where the person finds out, oh my God, my company's revenues just doubled in hmm. China. I'm getting 200 million instead of 100 million. Wow. I wonder if my meeting with Xi Jinping had anything, had anything to do with that. Interesting. <laughs> when I said we need to repeal the Jones Act. And you're able to travel to China still? And <laughs> Yes, I went six times when President Trump was president. Wow. Their view of me in this Chinese translation of 100 Year Marathon I mentioned to you, their view of me in the two prefaces is that this guy used to be a friend of China. He helped us a great deal. He helped with the weapon sales. President Reagan sold weapons to China, mm-hmm. almost a half billion dollars worth. So this he was a good guy, but now he's kind of lost his way. He's published this 100-year marathon book, which they say is ridiculous. We have no such strategy. But we hope in the future he will return to being a friend of China and contributing you know, as much as he already has to our wonderful American-China relationship. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very interesting. What would you say to conservatives who are you know uh, forthright in their uh, in their and genuine in their thinking about mm-hmm. these things, uh, who who are opposed to the Jones Act? What would you say to them uh, about chi- how this China's plans fit into that? I would say two things. First of all, I would admit philosophically, it's good to be in favor of free trade. That is the founding fathers' approach. But in, in the case of Mike Lee, who's done two books on the, on the Constitution and the fi- Founding Fathers, he should took, look more closely at Alexander Hamilton, mm-hmm. who was Mr. Tariffs on everything for what today we would call national security reasons, to protect our industries. So yes, free trade is wonderful. We can worship at the altar of free trade. But when another country is violating free trade, we're foolish to let them get away with it. And I think that's one of the insights that first President Trump had, and now Joe Biden is continuing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I, I, I'll put one more plug in, one final plug in for the book. It Thank is you. fantastic. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is so insightful. And $16, it, the if you, paperback edition. <laughs> if, you wanna, if those who want to be more woke to China, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, and, and are just getting started, this is a, a great place to start. And, and uh, I've read two or three or four, uh, uh, several other works uh, since then. I, I don't know if there's any others that you would recommend in addition to this one, but uh, it's, uh, it's so important, I think, for us. Uh, the American public to understand it. I mean, that's the first step is recognition. Mm-hmm. And, and, Absolutely. And then we're in a hole. We got to stop digging uh, and figure a way to get out of it. And mm-hmm. we can, I think. Uh, it's just not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult with a, a democratic, uh, a, a small d democratic society that we have, mm-hmm. uh, and and all of the conflict we have now. And we would have to give up so much. Uh, in consumer side, on the consumer side of things, in the in the short term, mm-hmm. in order to to recover uh, and get get back to par with uh, where we need to be in our competition, I think. But but I think we can do it, and I hope you share a little optimism in that regard. I do, and one of the uh, again, it's almost a joke. One of the comments you hear a lot uh, from the progressive side of our country is, well, America has been number one, you know, for so long, at least 100 years, maybe more. But we've caused all these wars, and we have inequities in our own society, and we back dictators overseas. It's time for another country like China, which is guided by Confucius and moral principles. Maybe it's time for the Chinese to have their turn leading the world, and let America just rest and take care of our own uh, domestic inequities. Mm. That's scary that's, to me. That's the word we don't want to live in. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate our time together. I wish we had more time, um, but uh, it's it's been fascinating conversation. Um, uh, we uh, any any final thoughts from your end before we sign off? I am worried about asymmetrical um, strategies, where the Chinese strategy is just so much smarter and more focused than ours, because they take America more seriously than we take China. Mm. That's what I think I'm most worried about. I wish there were like thousands of Pillsbury's 
who spoke Mandarin and interviewed defectors and, and worked in the government. So if I die tomorrow on the way home, you know, there's 2,000 more to replace me. Mm -hmm. China seems to be that way. Their focus on how to beat America is extremely impressive. We just don't seem to be able to produce yet the people, the institutions, to think about China, what to do, as you mentioned with George Kennan in 1946-47, I don't think we have our long telegram or our NSC 68 for China yet. Mm -hmm. There's people who want to claim that they know what to do. But if you look at their recommendations, it's pretty shallow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Thank you, Dr. Pillsbury, for, for your insights today. Uh, thank you, listeners. Uh, this is Mike Roberts signing off. <laughs>